Despite the introduction, I actually work for Verifone. It's a global payments company. Uh, you'll know us because of FPOS terminals. And in New Zealand, we run the FPOS payment gateway. But as great as Verifone is, I am actually talking about Fire. Specifically, I'm talking about how automation saved the project that I worked on. I'm talking about how that project saves people's lives. Therefore, if we conflate things together, I'm talking about how automation <laughs> saves lives. So this one's for Francois. <laughs> I work for a, um, a crown organization, that, or crown entity, that um, specialised in rescuing cats from trees. That is Fire and Emergency New Zealand. Now, Fire and Emergency is, a, is not just the fire department, it's a general um, emergency services provider. It does things like fire, obviously, it does chemical spills, it does biohazards, it does medical emergencies, and it rescues cats. It also does urban search and rescue all around the world. This was my office for a year. That was my desk. That's the back of a fire truck. The seats aren't very comfortable because they're designed for you having big breathing apparatus, and if you're just a geek like me, there's just a hole. <laughs> I, um, so I worked on what was called the incident response software. What happens is when an incident occurs, like a fire, we have tablets, BYOD devices, in the truck. Um, and then we get a real-time feed of information flowing through so the firefighters know exactly what's happening at any one point in time. There's routing information. You can see where trucks, where the other trucks are en route. You can see where all the other teams are, so the status of them. And you can see where all the information that you need to know is, things like fire hydrants, things like um, is a bridge going to hold the load of a fire truck because they're really heavy, um, all the plans, site reports, buildings, that sort of thing. This is what it looks like installed. This is a, um, a little bit of a navigation PC. Um, it's for the driver, which just does the routing information. This um, tablet here does all the other information, all the, um, all the incident response information, all that real-time streaming of data, and there's ones in the back seat as well. And this is the old system that we we're replacing, which is you know, eight-digit codes which represent all this stuff, and no one understands it. But people in this audience, we don't really care about tablets. We care about servers. So this was a bespoke server that the fire department built to run this software on the truck. It's a rugged, rugged server. It's pretty powerful. It had a Core i7 processor, uh, 32 gig of RAM, 512 gig hard drive. It has a Raspberry Pi in there. It has LoRaWAN, which is long-range mesh networking. It has uh, UPS for um, uninterruptible power supply. So the battery, if the power gets cut, um, it'll still function and be able to shut down efficiently. It also has um, information being pumped into it from the fire truck about its status. And this other device, this is a networking platform. It has multiple cell phone radios. It has Wi-Fi, GPS, a wireless access point, and satellite communications. Together, we made fire trucks into IoT devices. <laughs> so our requirements. So we needed that redundant communication. We always needed comms to go through. We needed that real-time inf information on the incident. We needed to feed that information to the firefighters. We needed offline maps. And we needed offline documents, plans, diagrams, schematics, photos. I was actually sent down to the Christchurch for the, um, for the earthquake in 2011 when I was working for a different company as part of the response team. And one of the problems we had was we were trying to get information to people on site at rescue sites, trying to get into buildings, they needed plans and schematics, and there was no cell phone communication. All the roads were buggered, I think was the technical term they used. Um, there was just no way to get this stuff from data centres where it was useless to the front line where it was needed. So it was important to have this stuff in the trucks and in suitcases as well. Um, that offline hazard search where we were showing all the information around the fire truck and around the incident that's important to them. And we needed to allow firefighters to update the system, to feed information back so we could create more of this information. We needed to track the fire truck. We needed to know where it was, what its, um, what its fuel level was. Uh, is it sirens going? Is it upright? And we needed to be in hub for an incident because, you know, we lose communications. We still need to be able to provide that information to the firefighters. And we've got data coming into this thing from police, from spy agencies. It needs to be really, 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 really secure. A ridiculous amount of encryption. So this is what we had. We've got fire stations, we've got data centers, we've got um, you know, headquarters. 
we send information to the cloud, in this case it's Azure, and then we go down through that communication platform to the fire truck and to the tablet. The tablet and the fire truck are talking to each other. It's also communicating with the cloud and back to the fire station. You have multiple fire trucks going on route. They're all talking to the cloud, and that information is flowing through to all the tablets and all the fire trucks. When we get to an incident, we create a mesh network, and the fire trucks talk to each other directly. So you may be thinking there's some crazy stack running on top of a fire truck, but actually it's all pretty standard stuff. Ansible for automation, Git. Uh, Docker, we had a microservice architecture. We had 25 microservices. Redis for an for a on-truck bus. But it turns out that you know, we have standard, standard technology, but fire truck isn't really a data center. There's a wee bit of a, you know, circumstances around the operation which isn't the same as a rack. And we have some questions, like what happens if there's an update and there's an incident and the truck has to leave halfway through? What happens if the update fails? The last thing we want is these emergency services vehicles to go out to an incident to be fighting a fire and they don't have the information they need. There's, a, there's more than a thousand trucks in New Zealand and they're all over the country. How do we manage those? Some of these vehicles, they're sitting in sheds in the back of someone's farm in the middle of nowhere. They're a volunteer, uh, a volunteer truck. They've got no, um, no power, no Wi-Fi, no cell. They're offline for months at a time. How do, we, how do we manage that? How do we keep these things secure? And with all of that, how do we iterate quickly? How do we release early? How do we release often? How do we push updates out to all these things? So automation is the answer, and that's why I'm here. We needed a continu continuous delivery pipeline. And to do that, we built a custom orchestration platform. Minikube wasn't something that we really considered running in production on fire trucks, so we had to build something to run the docker. So we had some rules. We only update the fire truck, and there's some terminology here. If the fire department calls a fire truck an appliance, so if I skip the alternate between them, they're both the same thing, appliance and fire truck. So we only update when it's at home. We don't update if, um, if it's moving or its lights are on. We do blue-green updates. I'll um, go into detail on that in a bit. And we're always able to roll back to a good state. If we do an update and it fails, we can roll back to a, a version that was working and we have health probes. The health probes not only look to see if the microservices are running as expected, they also check to see temperature. You know, temperature is very important in a vehicle. Power usage, we don't want to drain the batteries. So a pipeline. We built on Visual Studio Team Services. We had automated tests. If we pass our tests, if we go through all our processes and our release gates, we push to Azure Container Registry, and we update some playbooks, Ansible playbooks and Git. The truck does an Ansible pull when it's ready to do an update. And then it sends the update information to our custom orchestrator, which pulls the containers down from the container registry and then does the updates. So as I said, we have blue-green deployment. The idea with blue-green is you have two stacks running side by side. One is live, one is idle. When you do an update, you actually update the idle stack. In this case, it's green. The live stack is blue. We've got an Nginx API in front of it. We send through the updated containers. We prove that it works. Once we're happy that it's, that it's working, we change the API endpoint so that we're pointing our live environment to the, new, to the green side, to the new stack. And then our old stack, we decommission. All right, so we've got a fire truck. It's sitting at its station. It's all happy. It's, it's up to date, it's ready to go, there's a fire. Away we go. So we're driving along. I don't know if you can see it, that's, that's radio. We're talking to the, to the cloud, we're talking to the tablets. You know, we're sending all this information where we are, what's happening, and the cloud's talking back to us. And then there's other fire trucks in there, all talking to the cloud, and they're all talking to each other, and the tablets, and all this information's going everywhere, all this real time streaming. And then we've got these firefighters. Oh, we've got these mesh networks, sorry, so I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, that's a mesh network. Those are all talking together. So the fire trucks are talking together and the stuff's going to the cloud and it's all coming down. We've got these firefighters and they're streaming heart rate and they're streaming you know, health and temperature and they're actually streaming video if they want. And we've got these pseudo satellites, which are these drones that fly around it 20 kilometers up. And they're sending down information and they're, they're sending streaming video and they're providing comms. And this needs to work anywhere in the country. And in fact, it needs to work anywhere in the world because we send fire teams everywhere. So we went, we built most of this, we did a pilot, we got a few trucks, we went out and ran some scenarios. 
and there were problems. <laughs> I think you'll find that the scope was quite large. <laughs> so we had quite a few software problems. Um, some of them we knew about, some of them were surprises. Good thing about software is we can iterate on it, we can fix it. That's what trials are for. Unfortunately, we also had hardware problems. It, the, the, it was overheating. And I thought this was a good thing. It was winter. You know, it's an extra heater in the fire truck, but that argument didn't fly. And so this device on the left here, the server that we were built for this project, was decommissioned and brought out of scope. And with it went our offline strategy. <clears throat> so you can imagine a conversation I had with my boss the next day. And this is probably multiple conversations with multiple stakeholders. For, um, for simplicity and to, to add the drama, I'm just going to make this boss who's in red. And I'm sure everyone's had these sorts of conversations before. So I'll be saying something like, so, I suppose we're not doing offline anymore. My boss would say something like, well, uh, it's actually a core requirement for the project. Of course we're doing offline. I'll say, but we've lost our, um, our offline hardware. Like, how are we going to do this? Is that, is that going to be a problem? <laughs> well, actually, we can buy something off the shelf. HP's got this server, which, um, which does about 95% of what we need, um, speci specifically designed for this scenario. No, we've, um, we've blown our budget. We've got no money for this. OK, we've got all these Raspberry Pis lying around. They're free. We've got them. All we need to do is buy some cases, some USB sticks, some little UPS device. You know, we can do probably 80% of what we need until we can get the funding to do a proper solution. Now, that sounds a bit expensive. <laughs> OK, let me get this straight. <clears throat> we've got no money. No. And we've lost our core capability. Yep. But we have exactly the same requirements and the same deadlines. <laughs> oh, you've got two weeks. So, MVP time. What are the core requirements that we needed to, to, to do to, to make this thing work? We actually already had the communication platform. That, um, that other device, that, that device that sat next to it, that wasn't decommissioned, that provides cell phone, Wi-Fi, all that sort of stuff. We had real-time information on the incident. That's an online service. We could modify things to make it work. It didn't need the offline hardware. This is where things get hairy, offline maps. Mapping data for all of New Zealand is multiple terabytes. We, um, we had some, some sort of solutions to get it down to tens of gigabytes, but that's more than what we've got, which is nothing. We need this offline documentation. Once again, tens of gigabytes of data, and we're expecting it to grow exponentially because we're allowing firefighters to feed this information back into the system. That offline hazard search, we've got hundreds of millions of rows in a database that we need to search through and plot on a map in real time, stream it while the truck's moving around. We need firefighters to update that system. This used to be offline, we decided to make this online as a separate project. We got rid of the need to track the appliance. We already had a rudimentary system, it worked. It wasn't great, but it worked. Still need to be a hub, still need to be secure. So this is what we have to work with to solve this problem. We've got fire stations, we've got a cloud, we've got a communication platform in the middle, we've got a fire truck that used to have a big computer in it, now it's got nothing, so it's kind of useless, and we've got tablets. And this is where automation is magic. This is, this is amazing. So, fire truck was run with Ansible. What happens if we create some virtual machines in Azure, point Ansible at them, we've got this amazing virtual fire truck in the sky, looking down over all of us. We create a VPN connection, and the tablets now have real-time live updates from a fire truck, as long as they've got comms. So we still need something in the middle there for our offline strategy. One solution is to try and shoehorn it onto the tablet, but they're massively overtaxed, and they don't have the storage. But we do have this other compute platform, this communication device. So this is a whopping single-core ARM processor. It's got one gig of RAM, eight gig hard drive. It's got a locked down proprietary version of Linux with no package management. So this is, of course, the solution to the problem. <laughs> so 
So we thought, what happens if we put a USB stick in the back of it for storage, and we do a bit of modification? This is what it looked like installed. What it has is Tomcat. <laughs> Tomcat is a web server that runs Java. You know when you, um, when you hop on a, on a train or a bus and it's got free Wi-Fi and you have to sign, sort of sign away your soul to get access to it? That's what this thing's for. So you, you can update a website, fill in some information, and whitelist, um, whitelist the users access to the internet. But it was modifiable. There was a system to update it. So we thought, OK, we can probably shoehorn a REST API on top of this thing and reverse engineer some of the hardware, reverse engineer some of the GPS stuff, and surface pretty much everything we want except for that hazard search, because most of it was just files. So that hazard search again, we search for millions of records. We plot them on a map in real time. We're streaming. We can't use any resources because we're running this thing on a networking platform. If we use resources, networking goes down. Fire trucks have no communication. Bad things happen. And also, the vendor wouldn't be very happy. We have to be build it with the technology that's already on the truck. We can't install a database. We can't install a new programming language. It has to be secure. It has to be offline, of course. So the hazard search. First idea was to build it in Java. We had Tomcat. There's SQLite. Built it in that. Ran a POC. Thing crashed. Rebooted. Back to square one. Python's on there. Did the same thing. Rebooted. Next step was to build a dedicated database in Python optimized for this, for the scenario to stream X and Y coordinates off a disk. Worked, but it was, um, it was too heavy for the system. It wasn't acceptable. Port that to Java, try it again, same difference. At this point, out of ideas. Thinking, well, maybe if we get some bash, then we'd like grep a file. <laughs> it wasn't going to work. So I remembered um, something called Rust, which is a programming language from Mozilla Foundation. And it's like C. It's, it's very low level, or relatively low level, I should say. It's really fast. Um, and so I ported it into this, not expecting much. And lo and behold, it worked very well. Um, it would be streaming thousands of records at 2% CPU load and, and no RAM usage. So that was a big success. So how do we do CD to this? Our CD system formerly was Ansible, was Docker, um, was Git. There was a whole lot of these modern technologies, you know, all the, all the buzzwords you can think of. So we had rsync. <laughs> and bash. So we thought, OK, we create a VPN connection to the cloud, create an SSH tunnel through that, arsing down our content from our virtual fire truck in the sky, and it worked. So this was our stack. That moved to the cloud. We added this new stack on the truck, which was a bit of an interesting one. So there were some lessons from this. Automation is amazing. It gave us a huge amount of flexibility to change. Um, we just wouldn't have been able to do what we did. We pivoted in, in hours, pretty much. All, need, all we needed to do was fire up some VMs, repoint Ansible, do a few little changes, and things are working amazingly. It was, it was magic, literally. Well, not literally, but it was magic figuratively. <laughs> Automation gives us the flexibility to, to grow. We could manage a fleet of 1,000 fire trucks easily. It could grow to thousands, um, or it could be just 10 or 20. It didn't matter. Creativity can solve any problem. We thought we were screwed. You know, we lost all our functionality, but we still had to meet deadlines to, to get funding. So if you take a step back and you look at, look at all the parts, you can actually see, well, maybe, maybe if we do this and that, then actually you know, we can solve problems even if we're losing capability. And you can solve new problems with old technology. So we, we had a CD system that was reasonably, reasonably state-of-the-art, and we took the lessons learned from that, um, some of the lessons from how Git operates, some of the lessons on how Ansible operates, and built something in, in rsync and bash. And actually, I didn't go into details on it, but it was doing things like, like comparing hashes to check state before rsync. It was doing blue-green um, with, uh, with sim links. It, was, um, it could do rollback. It could do all the functionality that we needed. Everyone's going to say, get buy-in. 
And of course, you need to get by. And our job is to talk to people, to go around and, and get everyone on the same side. But often, you won't get buy-in until you do a proof of concept to prove that, the, prove that, that it works. And often you can't prove that it works unless you get buy-in. We've got a chicken and egg situation here. So sometimes you just have to go off and do it and ask for forgiveness. If that works, it's amazing, and you're a hero. If it doesn't work, well, you know, maybe CVs. <laughs> the other thing is, so fire appliances put out real fires, fire trucks. But for us, we put out virtual fires, and automation just makes that job so much easier. You know, our pipelines are our fire hoses. Ansible is our water. I don't know how, where this analogy is going, but <laughs> thank you.